Our presenters today are from two very active national gun violence prevention groups, the Pax Christi USA Gun Violence Prevention Working Group and Nuns Against Gun Violence. These two groups share a passion for nonviolence and working towards common sense gun laws across the country. Jean Allen is an active member of Pax Christi, Massachusetts and a charter member of the Pax Christi USA Gun Violence Prevention Working Group. Mike Walsh is a longtime member of Pax Christi Southern California and is also a charter member of the Pax Christi USA Gun Violence Prevention Working Group. I've had the opportunity to get to know both Mike and Jean in our virtual meetings, and I can tell you that they are both fierce fierce advocates for positive social change and common sense gun laws. Dr. Jennifer Kreisak is the Director of Strategic Planning for the Franciscan Peace Center based in Chicago. She is also a founding member of Nuns Against Gun Violence and serves on the Coalition Steering Committee. Jen Morin Williamson is the Peace, Justice, and Ecology Coordinator for the Sisters of the Precious Blood in Dayton, Ohio. She's also a founding member of Nuns Against Gun Violence and serves on the Coalition Steering Committee. We are honored to have all four of these gun violence prevention advocates with us today. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jean to give our opening prayer. Um, yes, both of our groups take a faith-based approach to gun violence prevention, relying on God and grace to ground our activism and advocacy. As Pope Francis said, there is power in prayer. And so we begin this session with prayer. And thank you for the author of this prayer for allowing us to use it. Loving God, you created for us a world of beauty, order, and endless possibilities. But today, ours is a world often in chaos, war, famine, drought, so many isms, lack of respect for life and for one another. In this country, we face these issues day after day. One of these is uppermost in our minds these days, the horror of gun violence, which continues to ravage our nation, our society, our people, and even the youngest of our children. Spirit God, we give you all names, holy, sanctifier, paraclete, advocate, and you are so much more, challenger, nudger, whirling wind and engulfing fire, mover, enabler, lover, breath of life. Be that for us, we pray. Instill in us your gifts of wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, reverence, and awe. Pentecost us. Enable us to be as daring as the newly inspired apostles, to be bold in our defense of the right of all persons to feel safe wherever we are, unafraid of being forever silenced by those who are armed with weapons and angers and sometimes even hatred. Give us the courage to speak the word. Give us the audacity to take the actions needed to end this needless violence. In the name of our creator, God, in the name of the word of life, and in the name of the fire of love, amen. And uh, now, um, Mike, will speak about uh, gun speak and how uh, people talk about guns and gun use in our in our country today. Jen, do we have our slides? Yes, up. It's up. Oh. Hmm. 
weird. I don't see it. It's on the screen, Mike. I think you should. Oh, you you want the results of the survey, yeah? No, no, I've got that. I've got that. Oh, you the got slides that. are up. Slides are up. Hmm, I can't see them. What am I doing wrong here? I can see them. <laughs> Mike, you have to ch might have to change your view in the top right hand side of your um, screen. Well, a speaker, no. Speaker, no. Uh, no, I've changed it to everything I can. The speaker is out there. Gallery is out there. Speaker side by side. Um, that option didn't come up. <laughs> Interesting. No. Mine, is, mine is set on standard. Do you have that choice? Standard. No, I don't. That's weird. Very weird. I thought we'd have this. But you know what you're going to say. And Jennifer can just keep up with you with the slide. <laughs> I can. That'd be perfectly fine. I, and I sent you okay. the email with the um, the slides as well. If you want to pull it up in your okay, okay. Sorry about that, Mike. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, Neither do I. I, I, I usually see them. Well, it's no problem. You see the slides, and everything. Well, a good afternoon again for this uh, joining us for this very important uh, breakout session. We're uh, very excited to have you all here. Um, we have been uh, working on this for. Uh, quite some time, and we, uh, I think we've got some interesting questions for you. Uh, and you've a lot of you have done the survey, so we have the uh, we have the results in, which we can share with you. Um, as Sherry said, this is sponsored by uh, our Pox Christie Gun Violence Working Group and Nuns Against Gun Violence, and both groups have been in existence for about eighteen months, and that's really in response to the uh, the pandemic of mass shootings across the United States. Both groups have been very busy informing their membership and educating all of us. And like Jean said, it's all foundation is faith, focus on dignity of life, which is the key element of Catholic social teaching. My name is Mike Walsh. I reside in Orange County, California, and I'm the coordinator for Pax Christi Southern California. As we mourn the loss of lives at yet another school shooting, the 45th shooting, and the 385th mass shooting this year, this year, 2024, and we aren't done with it yet. I also reflect that in the last six days since September the 1st, over 85 individuals of all ages and races and, and genders across the nation have been victims of gun violence. So let's get into our survey questions. And you've all responded to them, and we have the results in. So the first survey question was, gun laws, gun laws are a recent development. And 82% of you answered false. But you're correct. Gun laws are not a recent development. As far back as the Revolutionary War, gun ownership was regulated and inventories were taking of weapons in the community so that if, if they needed a local militia had to be formed, they'd know where to find their weapons. Even in the wild, wild west, which we think is being gun-toting times, guns were banned in towns, and by the end of 1800s, most states prohibited the carrying of guns. And today, all states are allowing gun carrying, guns being carried, with some restrictions and requirements, obviously. But gun laws have been around a long time. So as we go through these survey questions, we're having you to think about, is this information you can use when you're in discussion with somebody, or let's say a heated discussion with somebody who has who is an advocate for Second Amendment rights and feels there would be no gun laws required at all, Maybe we can give you some information you can refute their comments with rationally, quietly. 
just simply by saying, you know, gun laws have been around since the Revolutionary War. Check it out. Check it out for yourself. And that way, we don't have to get into a long, lengthy argument with them. The second uh, question was, true or false? America has an all-encompassing gun culture. And 68% of you said it's true. Well, the answer is really false. Only 5% of the population own guns. 5%. Think about your own neighborhood and your community. And only 1% carry guns on a daily basis. So we can hardly say we have an all-encompassing gun culture. 5% of the population really own 1% of all the guns, or 90% or of all the guns. We'll find a large gap between urban and rural groups. But to think really informally that we are obsessed with guns, I don't think that's true. Many new gun buyers are purchasing their weapons for self-protection rather than due to a fascination with guns. So it's another way you can respond to questions you have from people. Very small percentage of the population. 5% are gun owners. So I think that that's, that's another refutation from myths we hear. Let's go to the next one. The third item is, question was, an armed society is a polite society. Everybody's answered it right. False. <laughs> we know this is not true. An armed society is not a polite society. Scientific evidence shows that an armed society is a more dangerous society and not a more polite one. Research also shows that gun ownership levels rise. So do fatal shootings of police officers by civilians and civilians by the police. More shootings by police of civilians can result in, what do you think? A lot of unrest especially when those shootings occur disproportionately against identifiable groups. We've seen that happen over and over and over again over the last five, six, seven, ten years. Therefore, arming more civilians not only makes for a more dangerous society, but a stable one, a cohesive one as well. I just think of the young man that was in Minnesota and he went out as a vigilante and started shooting people. You know, that's... He's armed, but he's not... He's not looking at this from the perspective of, do I really need to engage myself with these people? So let's go to the next question. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. Now, how many times have you ever heard that? From the Second Amendment group, I mean, come on, we've heard it 100,000 times. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. Your responses were 89% fit false. Well, that's good. Because it is false. While it is people who kill, pull the trigger, guns are more lethal than, than knives, clubs, and other weapons available to us. Emergency room physicians observed firsthand the damage difference between guns and other elements of, of, of arm, knives, clubs, whatever. And, and the guns are like far greater damage. Think of a bullet from an AR-15, the one that was used a few days ago in Georgia. That bullet has a multiple velocity of 3,000 feet per second. <laughs> Think of that, 3,000 feet per second. So if you're a student and you saw this gun pointing at you and you decided to get out of the way, your chance of getting out of the way are slim. And the damage inflicted by the projectiles is well beyond the damage produced by an individual wielding a knife or a blunt instrument. All of those that have been on this call that have been in the military and have had to have a, a weapons uh, 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 training in my time, when I was there in the 60s, we used the M16, which is the same thing as an AR-15. And it, we're told very simply, if that bullet hits Anybody, a person anywhere on their body, it can cause damage, severe damage, death or other damage. So let's move to the next question. The fifth question was, gun violence is the way we pay, is the price we pay for freedoms. 
for our freedoms? And I think the response was 70% are false. I think that's right. Uh, that is false. We don't need to have weapons, uh, gun violence to pay for our freedoms. You know, while some mass murder will still exist, other free countries have adopted measures such as licensing, gun owners, banning especially dangerous weapons. Think of New Zealand back in 2019. After a mass uh, shooting killed 50 people, they banned assault weapons in their country. And that has reduced the number of, de reduced the number of deaths dramatically. In fact, many countries with a higher freedom ranking than America have much lower lo levels of gun violence as a result of the type of regulations. There's a recent survey that said, when you think of this country, what do you think of? And they go through all these European countries, countries around Africa and South Africa and Southeast Asia. When they come to the United States, the response they have is the survey said they think of guns. So guns are associated with the United States. That's horrifying. The last one is gun laws are the first step to complete disarmament of our population. Slippery slope, slope argument. Did we get a response on that, Jen? Yes, 89% said false. 89% said yes? Said false? They said or? false. They said okay, good. 89 is the word false. That's good because that's the answer is false. All these questions are false. They're all myths that were perpetuated over and over and over again. And this response <clears throat> you hear from the gun lobby is that <clears throat> it's usually a sign that gun rights advocates have no substantive argument to make against a proposed gun law. Gun rights are alive and well in the U.S., <clears throat> excuse me, as witnessed by the recent Supreme Court decisions amid many state laws that have been expanding gun rights over the last 30 or so years. Also, the quantity of guns manufactured and the number of guns held by into civilians in the U.S. are growing faster than the population, showing that guns are in no way endangered. The whole feeling is that if we take away the assault weapons, they're going to come for the handguns. If we take away the long rifles are going to come for the handguns. We want to eliminate assault weapons, first of all. That's it. So when we respond to these myths, you know, it's good to be able to have some substantive information and knowledge about what's going on. Our gun violence prevention group read a book called American Carnage, which all this information is from and were used by their permission. And in that book, they debunk 35 myths about guns in America. And I encourage you to read the book. It's full of unbelievable information and it, it can really help you in letters to the editor. If you want to write on a gun violence issue, you can pr produce information that's more valid and debunk these myths. But I think the key is educate yourself as well as being taking action, which we're going to be talking about that in a short while. And go to the websites that the organizations listed in the last slide. Guns Against Gun Violence, the Brady Group, you know, Sandy Hook Promise, all these groups, you know, Mothers Demand Action, Every Town for Gun Safety. They all have great information and great resources to educate yourself. The idea is to give you the information to be able to respond to people. And of course, our biggest response is our faith response. And I just want to share with you a recent quote statement on gun violence from who else but the bishops of the metropolitan province of Atlanta, right there in Georgia. And part of the statement reads, in the face of so much needless and seemingly endless bloodshed, it is tempting to fall into hopelessness and despair for our future. Our faith, however, does not allow us to do so. It demands that not only we cling to hope, but we also take necessary action to bring about a just and peaceful world. It demands that we take action to protect human life and put an end to the violence. 
human life is sacred. We must raise our voices in upholding the intrinsic dignity and value of all human life. We call on all citizens, elected officials, and religious leaders to work together to put an end to such senseless violence. We are one nation under God. Again, we must stop these horrific crimes. Our first priority, therefore, must be to prevent firearms from falling into the hands of those who would carry out violence against our children in schools, against their families, and against themselves. I couldn't have said it better or even considered it better than what the bishops of Atlanta have said. Then I'd like to pass it to Jean for an overview of Fox Christie USA's Gun Violence Prevention Group. Thanks, Mike. Um, that's great information to help us with our dialogue and try and become less polarized. Um, and one of the things on your slides noted that a high percentage of Americans have been touched by gun violence. And I would say that that's true for me. I have a friend uh, who was killed by gun violence and many of the patients um, uh, because I was a nurse practitioner in the city for many years. Um, I had many patients who had been um, victims of gun violence. And so that's part of what stimulated me to become a part of the Pax Christi USA Gun Violence Prevention Working Group. And I'll talk a little bit about this group and pardon me as I stumble over some words uh, and maybe get emotional because it's it's very emotional and uh, personal to me. So in the wake of several memorable acts of gun violence in the early 2023, 18 months ago, including a mass shooting in Nashville, Tennessee, the National Council decided that we needed to form a group made up of local group members, so grassroots, to work to counter gun violence. And the stated mission is addressing the epidemic of gun violence in the United States. Now, the mass shootings grab the headlines, but other gun homicides, gun injuries, and gun suicides are more numerous. And we determined that our particular emphasis was going to be on exploring the root causes of gun violence in our society and analyzing its etiology through both intergenerational and multicultural lenses. So the first big thing we did was host a webinar in June of last year um, on National Gun Violence Awareness Day entitled Say Their Names. And this program underscored the importance of personalizing the reality of gun violence in a country that's grown desensitized to all types of violence. And the moving reading of the names, ages, and locations of those killed by gun violence in the prior week bookmarked the presentation as our opening and closing prayer. And there were 217 of them. 217 people dead, lives lost, loved ones gone in one week. So that's the, the scope of the problem. And uh, one of our other first steps was education of ourselves and then uh, later of others. And we recently completed a book study as Mike mentioned, On American Carnage by Thomas Gabor and Fred Gutenberg. Please do not confuse it with the book about Donald Trump that has the same name. Um, and Mike has talked a lot about what's been in this uh, book. And we took the information and we delved into what we learned through a faith-based lens. And we hope to share that blueprint for the book study for other groups to use as well, because we found that it was very helpful with foundational information that we can work in our dialogue um, with others against gun violence 
um, but it also had the faith perspective. So watch the Pax Christi USA website for more information coming soon. Um, and our members have remained active in their local and regional groups. And when we meet uh, every month, we share different ways that those groups have uh, found to spread the message of nonviolence. Um, and uh, that's always helpful to me. Um, they range from the artistic of crafting a banner with the sites of all the mass shootings for an entire year, and it traveled to different churches, and eventually, sadly, was long enough to wrap around the whole interior wall of the parish church of the woman who um, constructed this. Some of it is hands-on. One group uh, hosted a public event in which a portable forge was used to actually hammer guns into useful in implements. Uh, some are solemn, uh, silent individual, uh, interfaith vigil walks in neighborhoods affected by gun violence, followed by the reading of the names of those killed by guns in the past year, and then shared testimony and fellowship. Some of it's very practical. One group developed a toolkit for educating people on the problem of gun violence. And some of it was just fun, uh, participating with other groups in a tie-dyeing uh, event with elementary and middle school uh, kids in a violence prevention summer camp, uh, getting them while they're young with alternatives to violence. And then, of course, the usual public education through letters to the editor, um, legislative advocacy on the local and the state and the federal level. And then um, before today, our next biggest thing was on May 18th, uh, the working group presented a webinar, Beating Guns into Plowshares, a challenging conversation about gun violence with Shane Claiborne. And indeed it was both challenging, but also inspirational. And this can be, uh, there's a link to this on the Pax Christi USA webpage. And we recognize that there are so many groups working on the same issues, but they may be in silos because their constituencies are different. Uh, and we're often disconnected from one another. So we're beginning to work with members of other like-minded groups, such as Nuns Against Gun Violence, our co-presenters today, Moms Demand Action, the Brady Center, Sandy Hook Promise, um, and others um, in our local areas. And this way we can pool our resources and come together so that our voices are amplified and that can make more of a difference. Why should we reinvent the wheel? Uh, and then when we have these discussions with other groups, we bring our faith-based um, perspectives. We developed a prayer study action offering for gun violence awareness month in June, because what would Pax Christie be without a prayer study action? And are working on another one that will soon be posted on the PCUSA webpage. Um, the Gun Violence Prevention Working Group currently has 16 members from across the country. I'm Massachusetts, Mike's California, and we got everybody in between. Um, and we meet monthly by Zoom. And if you want to find out more about the Gun Violence Prevention Working Group, you can go to the Pax Christi USA website and uh, under programs, uh, click down uh, on for the working group tab. So that's just a brief summary of what we've been doing in the past year and a half. And now Jen will talk about uh, what nurses, uh, nuns, see, here I am, my nursing thing. Uh, nuns Against Gun Violence has been doing in their organization. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jean. Uh, I thought it was really interesting what you said, you know, the, 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 the prayer study action, because nuns against gun violence as being people of faith as, as well. We focus on education, prayer, and advocacy. It, it's the same kind of thing. We just have a little different words for it. So I, we wanted to start out again. My name is Jen Morin Williamson. I work with the Sisters of the Precious Blood in Dayton, Ohio, and I'm a member of the Nuns Against Gun Violence with Jennifer. Um, so Nuns Against Gun Violence, it's a coalition of Catholic sisters and their allies that affirm the value of human life through prayer, education, and advocacy for common sense, evidence-based gun violence prevention. It was really important that when we talked about a mission statement, we really wanted to say uh, common sense, evidence-based gun violence prevention, because we're not asking for extravagant things. I think, you know, Mike referred to people think that, oh, if we have to, uh, if we take away, if we ban assault rifles, then we're not gonna have guns at all. It's common sense. We're asking for things that that make sense. Uh, banning assault rifles doesn't mean that you can't have guns. We're just saying it makes no sense for the average person to have a weapon of war. Also, evidence-based. We don't want people to think we're just making up statistics. In this place where we live, where there is misinformation and disinformation, we want to be able to turn to some of these organizations that actually do the research. Every Town for Gun Safety does wonderful research, as well as some of the other organizations that Jean has, has shared with us. Next slide, please. So the Nuns Against Gun Violence, it grew out of a couple of different organizations, really. Uh, it, it Most directly, it, it came out of the Justice Conference of Women Religious, which actually kind of came out of the, the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. Now, I've worked with the sisters for two and a half years. I never heard of LCWR or JCWR until I started working for the sisters. <laughs> they're, they're great organizations, um, over 300 congregations <clears throat> that that work together towards uh, prayer. And, and, and in this case, um, the Justice Conference is that subcommittee for issues of justice. And it's interesting that we have so many things in common that we are working towards. And, and it, as, as Mike was also referring to, and Jean as well, like we do better when we work together. We can, we, have a, we can learn better, we can pray better, we can advocate better. So about a year ago, May, uh, at the Justice Conference of Women Religious, a group of, of uh, justice promoters got together and said, hey, let's form this group. And we decided to call it a coalition because we don't we're not ready to set up all the, you know, the things to be nonprofit and be self self supportive. But let's just support each other. Let's see what we can do across the United States and be a, a Catholic voice. A really important part of this was what is ours particularly to do in this area of gun violence prevention? You know, there's lots of excellent sec secular groups working towards gun violence prevention, but what is our city? What is the gift that Catholic sisters can give back? So this, the nuns against gun violence, again, we went, instead of just going with like nuns against guns, we didn't want people to think that we're trying to go crazy and take away your guns. We also have some sisters advocating with gun manufacturers to have better practices. And they wanna be able to come in and have dialogue and not the door not be shut on them. So we really said, we wanna know that what we're really against is the gun violence. So right now we have over 40 congregations of women religious across the United States. And we're always inviting more folks. If you are a member of a, of a religious congregation, or you are an associate or just someone who's like-minded, you would be welcome to join as well. Next slide, please. Some of the things I said we start with was prayer. And that's something that, as you can imagine, is a, a huge gift that Catholic sisters have to give. And we have, uh, one of the things we've established in our year and a half, not even quite year and a half, is monthly prayers to remember the victims of gun violence for that month. It's a 15-minute prayer, and it's got a lot of... Um, spirit and, and power and lament. And so again, that is that is available and you can get the link to that through our um, our website. Um, we did, I'm gonna kind of go, I, I told Jennifer to put these in the other order, I'm gonna go back the other way around. <laughs> so one of the first things we did though was uh, Sister Michelle Bastion, 
wrote a prayer, a novena against gun violence. And it's a beautiful prayer. It's what we started out with. And we've distributed that across the United States at conferences and on our website. So that was like the first thing we could give. The next thing we did was we did a, a prayer of service. And we also participate this year and last year in the, uh, the June, which is the month for Gun Violence Awareness Month. So we do those virtually. Uh, the first one was called uh, Lifting Our Light in the Darkness, and this last one was called Everybody a Sacred Heart. There, those are also available through our website, so they've been recorded, and you're welcome to, to um, pray with them. This last year, one of the things we did, uh, we had a sister that was really adamant about fasting during Lent. As, as people that are Catholic, you know, fasting during Lent makes a lot of sense. So the coalition came up with a whole way to not just fast from food or fast from any kind of activity, but to also add prayer specifically uh, to reduce gun violence and advocacy. There was an advocacy piece where people would, would write to the legislators, legislators or they would do uh, letters to the editor. Next. Uh, again, education, these kind of go hand in hand because you have to, uh, you, you know, as a part of everything we do, we have to, our prayer, we have to be educated, obviously. Um, we've been working with lots of different groups. Network is also an organization kind of that has flowed out of a coalition or a group of or lots of congregations of Catholic sisters 50 years ago to do justice work in the, in the name of Catholic Sisters. They have a, a podcast called Just Politics and a couple of our members just were on one of their their um, their podcasts. We did a, and actually our own Jennifer here did, and, and, uh, and Angie did a podcast called Faith and Firearms, connecting our Catholic social justice teaching. We also have co-hosted Shane Claiborne and he did his Beating Guns, uh, Hope for People Who Are Weary of Violence. Uh, and it's it was another one, uh, an education piece. We did that one virtually. He does the beating the guns into plowshares, but we he had a virtual presentation. Angie Howard McFarland did a uh, was did a whole part of her um, a matter of spirit. She wrote an, a wonderful article there, and uh, we did another justice podcast. You can read these all on here. Uh, so we've been trying to co to collaborate with other organizations again that are doing the similar things that we're doing that we can amplify our messages together. Next, advocacy. Uh, currently, we are collaborating with a, a, a lot of different organizations to stop uh, illegal arms to Haiti. That is coming up uh, September 25th and 26th. If you're available to attend, there will be a link to that with on our last slide. Uh, this is with a whole lot of different organizations. Again, we are we're we are collaborating with them. As we're wearing orange, uh, we're orange campaign. This is this happens um, every June. It, it is they'll pick a day at the beginning of the month uh, to um, call awareness to gun violence. And so we have participated in that online, uh, virtually and within the congregations. In the state of Ohio, which is where I am, we have done a billboard uh, campaign. There are many congregations from Cincinnati through Dayton, through Columbus, through Toledo, who put billboards up about gun violence and then advocating people to write to the legislators about some bills that, that can make a difference in reducing gun violence in the state of Ohio. Uh, we participate in uh, the weekly Gun Violence Prevention Roundtable, which is a national gathering through the Center for American Progress and the White House Gun Violence Prevention Office. And that's a fabulous call just to see and hear what's going on all around the United States. All right, next. Okay. Okay. So um, if you're interested in joining us, please go to our website. We do have a website, Nuns Against Gun Violence, and we would love to have you join us. And I think that's all I, I am going to say. Let me look at my notes. I start talking to get really excited. So I think I'm good. I'm going to pass it on to Jennifer. She's going to share a little bit more, some actors, some concrete actions that you can take. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. I'm Jennifer Krizak. Um, as Sherry mentioned, I'm the Director of Strategic Planning for the Franciscan Peace Center, which is a ministry of the Sisters of St. Francis, Clinton, Iowa. And I'm a member of the Nuns Against Gun Violence Steering Committee with Jen Moore and Williamson. 
we wanted to end today by giving you some pathways forward, ways to actually become a little bit more involved in gun violence prevention so that you individually can organize and um, advocate for gun violence prevention legislation. As everyone has mentioned previously, our faith guides our commitment to this gun violence prevention work. Each one of our organizations, as we've noted, is really committed to the elements of prayer, education, and advocacy. And in light of that, those are going to be common themes for the, the aspects of this conversation that I had as well. First, for all of us, it's been important for us to think about how we approach this topic as Catholics and as Catholic organizations. So of course, faith is guiding us. All of our work has been grounded in scripture, and we've been really trying to engage scripture throughout the process of um, becoming advocates for gun violence prevention. Catholic social teaching is a great guide for us as we're thinking about gun violence prevention and the reasons why we want to take the actions that we take, as well as giving us some ways to talk about how important it is to advocate for gun violence prevention. Um, as mentioned early, earlier, um, Mike mentioned that the bishops in Georgia have um, commented on the dignity of the human person. That is one very central, important aspect of Catholic social teaching that does guide our, guide our um, work, focusing on the common good, the preferential option for the vulnerable, and rights and responsibilities as well. Um, thinking about the ways that we are called to be responsible for everyone around us and our entire society and world. We are, of course, called as Catholics to be constantly forming our conscience, which means that we're supposed to be understanding Catholic teaching, um, including Catholic social teaching, and understanding the context in which we live and how we can actually um, respond to that context. So we need to be both informed and reflective on our society as well, reading the signs of the times, of course. So for all of us, our faith needs to be um, that thing that is influencing and compelling our advocacy for gun violence prevention. For both of our groups, I think you've heard each one of us say that we've been working on educating ourselves first and then going out and having those, those conversations. So we're moving from the personal to the communal. So making sure that we understand um, the context of gun violence in our culture, understanding how um, myths about gun violence, guns, themselves are used, and then being able to um, approach other people and have those hopeful conversations about um, an understanding of guns, the prevalence of gun violence in our culture, and inviting people to um, take some action for um, gun violence prevention moving forward. So we wanted to give you some suggestions on the steps that you yourself could take to be involved in gun violence prevention. And of course, the first part that we're going to suggest is that you educate yourself. Um, as Mike noted, and Jean as well, Pax Christi USA um, completed a book study on Fred Gutenberg and Thomas Gabor's American Carnage, Shattering the Myths that, um, uh, of Gun Violence. So that's one helpful book to use, and they're, they're willing to share the resources that they had to, to run that book study. Just Faith Ministries, um, also is offering a program called Preventing Gun Violence from Rhetoric to Real Solutions. And you can sign up um, for that particular study either as um, a member of a group that they've already formed or else um, run the program for your own church or your own Pax Christi USA chapter as well. Another way to be educated is to engage documentaries on gun violence in the gun culture. Um, and I've listed just a few of them here. There are a lot of documentaries out there that you can engage. The first one I have there is A Tree of Life, which is about the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So it talks uh, a bit about how it is, um, the view of the survivors, the things that they went through, the ways that they responded afterwards and how, how that has affected their life. Hear Me is the story of seven young people in Brookshire County, County, Massachusetts, and how it is that they have experienced gun violence and their hopes for the future. 
And Memorial is a documentary about the shooting in Highland Park, Illinois, and really focuses on the way that the community responded afterwards um, and pulled together as a community to create a memorial and to um, attend to the trauma that they were going, to, going through as a community. To educate yourself also, of course, there are plenty of webinars like the one that we're participating in right now, the ones that Pox Christi USA and Nuns Against Gun Violence have offered before. But there's also a lot of um, webinars that are offered on a regular basis from the National Gun Violence Prevention Organizations. Um, and I've included just a few of them here for you. There are many different organizations, but these are a few that we partner with on a regular basis. The Brady Center um, is focused on three different main goals, including policy change around gun violence and gun control, industry oversight, and changing the culture itself. So there's information about those three things on their website. The Center for American Progress, Jen mentioned earlier, they offer a weekly table call where people involved in gun violence prevention advocacy can come on and um, find out what the other organizations are doing so you're not operating in a silo, so you can partner with others and participate and promote the good work that other organizations are doing. Every Town for Gun Safety has um, a lot going on in different aspects, including some research on gun violence um, and advocacy around gun violence legislation. Moms Demand Action and Students Demand Action are also partners of Every Town for Gun Safety. They are two organizations that are very, very active on the local and national level. So if you want to get involved in um, a more secular organization focusing on Moms Demand Action or Students Demand Action are good options. They're more likely active in your own area. Every Town also offers their Survivor Network, which supports survivors of um, shootings and enables any survivors um, to be advocates for gun change if they so wish. So if you know of anybody who might actually benefit from their that network, I would put them in touch with that. Gifford's Courage to Fight Gun Violence comes out of Gabby Gifford's experience of being um, shot and recovering from that experience of violence. And they are um, active in terms of promoting gun violence legislation, and they have another arm of the organization called um, the Giffords Law Center, which does a lot of research uh, around legislation as well. Newton Action Alliance and Sandy Hook Promise both grew out of the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Newtown Action Alliance um, does a lot of work around campaigns for gun violence legislation. And you can be involved in those campaigns in different ways. And I'll talk a little bit more about them in a little bit. And then Sandy Hook Promise focuses um, more so on school safety and the ways that young people can be educated to recognize the um, potential for violence and to promote nonviolence within their, within their schools and their communities. Um, so as we... Um, move beyond ways of educating ourselves and engaging um, with those national organizations. There's also the ways that we ourselves can interact with people and talk about gun violence prevention and encourage those conversations. So the four of us, when we were discussing ways forward, we all noted that it was important for us to begin with our shared values. If you're gonna have a conversation with somebody, especially in this polarized environment, it's very beneficial to start from the things that you share in common with another person and the ways that you want to promote um, life and value and protect children, all, the, all those different shared values that you could start from. Um, these conversations are also um, good places to address those myths about guns and how those myths are actually used to shut down conversation, create polarization, and discredit gun violence prevention legislation. Um, so addressing the myths and pointing out that they're myths is very helpful. In order to do that, of course, you need to engage the statistics, you need to have some evidence so that you can back up the things that you're saying. So as Mike was noting earlier, having some of those resources on hand and 
um, engaging them will, will help us ha have um, more beneficial conversations here. In all of these conversations, especially the ones where people are in agreement with you about the ways forward, it is important to make sure that we encourage advocacy to promote change. If we don't actually encourage people around us who agree that we need to change our culture, it is not going to take place. So if you're having the conversations, point people in the directions of different advocacy opportunities as well. Um, so beyond our um, smaller circles of influence, there's also public events where you could be present either um, individually or as a member of an organization to encourage some conversation about gun violence. Um, different places have arranged for raw tools and the Guns to Gardens movement to do conversion events where they take guns, weapons of different kinds, and shape them into either garden tools or sculptures um, of different, different sorts. So that's one possibility there. A um, simpler option probably is to ask your local library to have a display of gun violence prevention books. And they could do that multiple times throughout the year just to raise some aware awareness. There are also um, many community events where we could be representatives of gun violence prevention advocacy, including the National Night Out events that probably just took place in your regions um, within the last few weeks. Every town for gun safety has partnered with local law enforcement at many National Night Out events in order to pr promote um, secure storage of weapons to prevent children from being harmed from um, weapons that are not held safely at home. So those are just a, a few of the ways that we could um, encourage our communities to think more about gun violence prevention. And of course, as we keep saying, advocacy is very, very important. Um, a few of us earlier have mentioned writing letters to the editor, so that is just one way forward. Contacting your lawmakers is incredibly important. So local, state, national lawmakers, everyone who represents you are possible people that you can contact about um, promoting legislation that's going to protect lives. There are sample letters from the Nuns Against Gun Violence Lenten Fast on our website. We encourage you to take those, rewrite them, shape them into the type of letter that you would want to share or just take what it is that we have um, and use that for your own purpose. Another possibility that you can en engage is the Newtown Action Alliance hashtag and and gun violence luncheon lobbies. Um, on most Mondays, they meet at both 12 o'clock p.m. for lunch and then 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time um, to learn a little bit about gun violence prevention legislation and then to call lawmakers. So this is a, a way that you can be directly involved in some of these conversations and encourage people to take action to promote gun violence prevention legislation. You can also join or partner with other gun violence prevention groups for public events and advocacy opportunities. Again, Moms Demand Action is incredibly um, active in many areas of the country and they are great partners to work with. And as we near November, it is of course important for us to be thinking about how we can vote as a matter of faith. Um, we are called as Catholics to be thinking through our values and how those values affect our approach to our public life. Um, and if we are going to be supporting candidates who promote gun violence prevention, then it's, I think, also important to let them know that we actually are um, supporting them for those reasons, so that they know the values that we have, we hold in common, and they remain committed to them as well. So these um, suggestions that we have come up for you in terms of education, personal conversation, advocacy, as well as other prayer opportunities that we're hoping that you will engage with as well, are just a, a few of the many ways that we can commit to working for gun violence prevention. By educating ourselves and others, we can better recognize and respond to the signs of the times and take action to change our culture, to protect and in, protect all people enable all people to thrive in our society. We hope that you join us in these peaceful paths to reduce gun violence.
Thank you. Jennifer, thank you so much for your testimony, particularly about the importance of advocacy, because I have the feeling that most people in our culture, in our country, are so overwhelmed by their daily lives, as well as all of the different news sources that they're bombarded with every day. But I think it almost takes a flare of advocacy sometimes to shake them a little bit and to make them realize, oh, maybe there is something that I can do, one small thing that I can join with someone else to do. So thank you for that. And thank you to all of our presenters today um, for giving us this helpful information. Your words give us so much to think about. Let's see here, let me go to a gallery view so I can see all of your beautiful faces. They give us so much to think about and um, I, I, I really think that, that we need this uh, information if we're going to move forward uh, in, in our own ways. Um, we need to all work together to make a difference uh, in gun violence that's present in our own communities and across our country. And I want to add that I particularly appreciate the way these two groups came together to organize this workshop. I think there's strength in numbers and that we, when I heard several of the presenters say, when we come out of our silos and join our areas of expertise, we have a much larger impact. So I hope that this is one of the first of many joint ventures for our groups and that all of you here today can take this idea of combining resources uh, to your own community advocacy programs. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn to questions that any of you may have. We have about 10 minutes left before we're gonna take a break and then we'll return to the main uh, to the main room after that. But does anyone have any questions of our presenters today? Feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. Let's see, we have several folks putting things into the chat here. Janice, I mean, I think this is her constant struggle. She talked about Tennessee, the legislature there, and I think this is true for many places in the South. They're not particularly interested in any gun violence prevention or gun control. So I think maybe several of you are struggling with that. Um, maybe one question here. Um, I know that many times, even in our own Catholic Church, we have difficulty getting our pastors, our priests to come out and deal with these issues in their homilies. Can I ask um, those of you who were presenters today, can you address that? What your experience has been in working with pastors in the church and uh, if you have found support for gun violence prevention there? Okay, I'll touch this one. Sadly, the answer is no. I mean, I I, I wish I had a better answer, um, but I, you know, we've had a hard time in our archdiocese uh, because we are um, combining parishes all across the diocese, and we have so few priests that they really feel overwhelmed. So. I wish I had a better way to say that would be great to, that they would that we'd hear this from the pulpit, but but we haven't. Um, but and I think that's what makes our work even more important. We are Catholic. We are the church. You know, it's good to hear it from the pulpit, but we are the church. We can do the work as well. So we can share it within our sphere of influence. Have the conversations. You know, gently, compassionately listening. Um, but we can do the work. Yeah, and a friend of mine suggested a very subversive way to get it done, and that um, you can ask for a mass to be said for the victims of gun violence. And so at least in in that very small way, it'll be in the bulletin that today's 8 o'clock mass is for the victims of gun violence, and they can't not put that in. Um, so, you know, sometimes we have to be a little sneaky. Yes. Uh, Madeline, I think you want to add to that. Yeah, I put it in the chat, but I think 
Um, one of the things we did a long time ago, maybe the people from Metro New York will recognize this, was to have this big effort about not buying war toys for Christmas. And here, this 14-year-old boy breaks my heart that he was given an AR-15 for a gift at Christmas. And even if the priest would pick that up and, and say, when you're thinking of Christmas gifts, think of Jesus. I mean... I can't even imagine a gun under a Christmas tree. They don't put mangers anymore, putting guns. But to me, that might be a little way you could approach a priest with that. Um, that that just always, it just, that tore me apart in a, in a way that um, the others didn't, honestly. So I don't know if anybody wants to add to that, but I, it may Thank be. You, yeah. You are so right about that. I think, Jean, would you have, did you have something to say about that? No, not that. Um, I'm going to go back to, uh, I think Mike said only 5% of the American people own guns. And how does that square that we have more guns than we do people in the U.S.? That 5%? Owns a whole bunch of guns themselves. <laughs> yes, you you find out that individuals that are gun advocates they'll own multiple guns, some as many as a hundred, thousands. And, there are there are people that own thousands of guns, <laughs> and they collect them and collect them and they buy them and they store them and they keep them. I and they I don't know what the use of all of them are, but it that's the that's the face. So five percent is roughly, let's say that's five uh, percent of three hundred million is what fifteen million people. Okay. It's still a lot of people. I mean, you spread it all over the United States. That's an awful lot of people. Yeah. Okay. My, my comment I want to make is the fact that uh, I think uh, uh, we mentioned the fact that we have done things on Gun Violence Prevention Day, which is June second or June 9th, which one of that in that area, right? Maybe have something to do at the um, at the library, which would be a great idea. We do the same thing on that weekend at a parish and ask the pastor, this is gun violence prevention week. And mm -hmm. we encourage people to wear orange. Could we put that in the bulletin? And could we have a little table outside where we can offer people information about gun violence prevention, you know, Catholic oriented, scripture oriented type things, uh, maybe books or whatever it happens to be. But another comment I want to make is that the second author of American Carnage, Fred Gutenberg. Guten, is it Gutenberg or Guten, Gutenberg? Gutenberg. 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 His daughter was the last victim at Marjorie Taylor Greene in Parkland. She was the last individual that the shooters got to. So he has a very, very strong opinion about the subject and got deeply involved in this right this book so i mean there's so much connection here it's unreal yeah and and to jean salmon i i believe the statistics were that 30 percent of americans own guns but five percent own like upwards of 80 percent of the guns oh okay that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, somebody told me one time that uh, guns don't kill people, people kill people. And I said, that's ridiculous. People with guns kill people. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Well, you put an AR-15 uh, <laughs> in the hands of anybody and the with a with a 20 round clip in it. And the damage is just unreal. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I shot one of those ones in the Air Force, and it's just, it's, I just never wanted to touch guns again. It's just absolutely uh, uh, frightening, frightening to have that in somebody's hands. Yes. I want to um, also emphasize the, uh, one of you made this point, I thought it was really a good one, the uh, rural-urban sort of differences there, too. I know being here in the South, um guns are sort of part of the culture in many ways in rural south and uh, we deal with that here in arkansas 
Um, in fact, many of our pastors in our Catholic churches for fundraisers, I know two of them specifically in this last year, uh, have had Glocks uh, uh, as part of a, of a silent auction. Yeah. So for their church fundraiser, because they have been raised in this way to not see that it's a problem. And I think often they don't see how it very much goes against Catholic social teaching, but there it is. And, and uh, if any of our presenters would like to comment on that, what they see in regards to the rural urban differences or the northern southern differences in gun ownership. I, I don't know those statistics, but I would say there we have talked about that there are places where they, they do give guns away in raffles or silent auctions. And there have been people that have written to their bishops and say, we need to stop doing this. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, you, you bloom where you're planted. If you are in a place where they do that, you know, write to your bishop. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, this is unacceptable. You know, yeah. as a group, four or five, you write to the USCCB, tell them you think they should make a statement. So I think that, you know, we can see what happens around us. And that's our opportunity. That That is the spirit opening the door for us to step in and to use our voice. And I, and I say that because you're doing justice work. Sometimes it feels like, it, it's it's hard. You, you don't get much done, but you can move the needle. You can change things a little bit. And so, you know, whatever you can do, just looking for those opportunities can make a big difference, I believe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, just to be aware, we have about four minutes before we're all going to disappear and go back <laughs> into another room. Um, somebody commented, Lynn Dragemeyer commented, other action we can take is allyship with local on the ground programs working with youth to prevent violence. So. Sherry, I'd like to comment too. I think yes. um, it's easy for us, especially following a school shooting to focus on school shootings or to focus on mass shootings following mass shootings. I think we also need to be incredibly aware though, that the greatest number of gun deaths in our country result from suicide. Yes. So keeping that in mind as we're working on gun violence prevention legislation is also helpful. It's, it's good to talk about the ways that safe storage can actually save lives. That the ways that um, educating people about having how, um, and I'm not gonna remember statistics right now, but um, people are, 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 great, are at greater risk of gun death suicide if they have a weapon in the household. That is a higher number, number for children than it is for adults too. So it's like three times more likely for kids than it is for adults. So keeping in mind that this is not just simply uh, a single issue topic within a within a lot larger issue, right? It's it's multifaceted. We have to think about the ways that um, gun violence occurs within different segments of our society, and we need to be thinking about how we can attend to each and every single one of those to honor the dignity of each and every single life. And I'd go back also to Jen's description um, at the beginning of her presentation on nuns against gun violence, that right now we're thinking about the ways that the US is exporting our gun violence epi epidemic, epidemic to other countries, including Haiti. We've gotta be, we, we need to intend to each one of those different aspects. And it makes it much more difficult and it makes the conversations much more difficult. Um, but thinking about um, having those conversations with people and noting gun death suicides probably is going to connect with people in a way that we probably, you know, you, you just don't know. But the, the numbers are so high that it's probably another way to talk to people and to get them to see that we do need to make changes in this country. Yes. Yeah. And, and a suicide attempt with a gun is much more likely to be successful on yeah. suicide. So as I said, I, I worked in healthcare, and part of the question that I asked everyone in their annual physical, is there a gun in your home? And um, many parents were offended. No, we're not gangbangers and stuff, because there is a lot of gang activity 
um, in our area. And I'm like, no, no, I'm asking this to everybody. Because then if you said yes, my next question would be, how do you store the guns? And and go into that rap about education, about um, safe storage and stuff like that. And then they would calm down and say, oh, that's a really good, that's a really good point. Um, but, you know, like at first, many, many moms were um, thinking that I was uh, stigmatizing them for being Latino in a in an area where there's a lot of Latino gangs. But no, it was like just to open the conversation to the next step. And yeah, if there's no guns in the home, well, that's that's fine. We won't have to go into that that area. We got a lot of stuff to go through. So. My we We've seen in California multiple public service announcements on gun storage. And one of them that was really effective, it starts off with a series of goofy things kids do, like they hit a ball inside the house and they break something and they go, oh, don't do that, don't do that. And there's some mm. kids playing in the mud and they're getting mud all over themselves. Oh, don't fall in there, don't do this, whatever you do. And the last one is a mother walking into a bedroom and there's her son. 17, 18 year old son with a gun on the bed. And then she starts screaming at him about, we told you never to touch, never to touch it. The whole emphasis is gun storage, it's gun safety. And they've been many different episodes, uh, uh, things like that, which I think is very effective, very effective. Absolutely. Anyone else before we sign off today? Or any comments from other presenters, if they want to add anything at all. I want to thank all of you for being here today. The, the very fact that you're here, I think, gives hope to all of us. Because sometimes it's hard to find that hope when there are so many tragedies happening. And we hear about it on the news constantly. So thank you very much for joining us. And special, special thanks to our presenters and um, I hope to a coming together of two groups uh, who share values and uh, that we can do this again in the future.